<laughs> Kenny, Kenny, Kenny just scored his 24th pocket watching victory. And with just a handful of days left in the season, there is no way Jesse can catch him. Kenny Caraway is the pocket watching champion of the world. It's unbelievable, man. It's unbelievable. Uh, you know, I just, I, I, it was the middle of the season. Everybody counted me out, you know, and I remember all the tweets. I remember uh, everything everybody had to say in the chat. You know, I just, I just stayed true to myself. If anybody was going to believe in myself, it was going to be myself. That's what Draymond taught me. You know, if anybody's going to believe in myself, it was going to be myself. And, uh, you know, I, I just, I'm a true champion. Mm -hmm. um, I got the heart of a champion. And uh, I'm great. You know, I just am. Man. I got a question. Oh, oh okay. So securing the Bagley brings up a good point. I'm down four, right? Uh, it's 24 to 20. That is correct. And we still got Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. Season ends on Thursday, right? It ends August 1st. So season, theoretically, wouldn't I be able to force a do or die? No, I'm we going, said August 1st. I'm going. No, it's August 1st. That is correct. Wouldn't I'm I be going able off to, of what you two guys said. You were the one who told me. You that, said you said you said he was 20 and 23 or whatever today. Then he won. So now he's 24 he's, and 20. He's correct? 24 and 20. So technically, the season's not over yet. I could force a do or die on next Friday if I were to win the Wait, next four. What the hell? I just celebrated. Well, I guess we all get to live through that again. <laughs> Remember when the Philadelphia 76ers released confetti that one time? <laughs> it's not over yet. We'll see you Monday, folks. I don't even know what's happening. I have to fact check my guys on the show. It's unbelievable. Secure in the bag lead. What the hell are you doing? Well, Mind was, your business. He was right. Shout out to Secure in the Bagley. He needs to change his name to Secure in the Jesse Victory. <laughs> We're back. We're back. <laughs> Them, no, that hey, that that, them, them that 295 James, was crazy. Them bro. jam That's... premature celebrations, boy. <laughs> That's tough. <laughs> there was a lot of premature that. celebrations going on. Like, oh. You need to get into the gym. We're pal. back. I'll be in the gym this weekend. We're we'll past that. The gym, pal. You need to call the Keith. Whatever you got to do. Crazy. That was um, great. Hey, I think that was. I think that was the closest guest of all time. Yeah, that was pretty. Yeah, that, I think you're correct. I think you're I, right. I was gonna go two twenty five, and I no, said, "No, nah, I don't no. think so." Then I said two oh five. I was like, "I don't." Th I, I I bet you. I said, "I bet you he didn't make two hundred million dollars." So that's how I got to one ninety. Good call. James Ham reluctantly joining us here. <laughs> James, uh, James, what grade? This was a conversation earlier in the day. I, I've got all sorts of questions for you. Strangely enough. <laughs> What grade would you give the Sacramento Kings offseason thus far? Hmm. Um. By the way, you look spectacular. Yeah, man. Hey. Like I'm, I'm, I'm Flawless. talking like 8K. I'm talking Olympic Flawless. quality video. Yeah, I, I don't. I'm not going to guarantee that it's going to hold up. So, okay, that's all right. Yeah, <laughs> that's all right. Um, let's see. Um, I, I want to say, like a B plus. Like, like there's a possibility it could have been better. But this is a really good offseason. I, I told you guys before, if you lost Malik Monk, you would have lost the offseason. And mm -hmm. I don't even know what you could have done. Even the DeMar DeRozan edition would have been like really good, but it would have got you like to a B minus B range. Um, you know, I, I think the the job isn't done quite yet. I think there should be like at least minor moves to like round out the roster, but uh I think the the reason I go B plus is because the Devin Carter injury um, just kind of takes him off the board, and and so you you know you want to give that an incomplete as a grade. I don't know whatever you want to do there, but I, I I just look at that one specific thing and say okay, um, that would be the only blemish on on what could be like a tremendous tremendous off season. Hmm. You know, it's it's interesting. I kind of maybe it's just me. I I feel like it might be a collective, but I I be forgetting about Devin Carter and the fact that they drafted them and mm -hmm. and and that being a part of the offseason. I think some of it had to do with um, nobody expected the the pick to be made, um, the draft class being relatively weak, and then mm -hmm. he gets hurt. We don't even really see him, and you kind of forget about that as an addition. Um, the B plus is fine. Even the B minus, 
there's little things I disagree with it that, that Kevin Pelton did. Mm-hmm. There's little things I disagree with. He was really him. snarky about the yeah, the like I, maybe trade. I disagree with his tone more than anything, yeah. but, which <laughs> we're interpreting because he did write this. He didn't say it right, but it's it's fair. It's fair. Like it is a B. It's not like he said D. You know what I mean? It's B minus. Yeah, he, he could have left, left the minus yeah, out. They could have, but you know, they the you take the draft into consideration and. You know, you you take into consideration they probably still, in a lot of people's eyes, need to do need another move with this roster. Um, I can I can understand that. I can understand that, Greg. Yeah, I don't know. You know, again, like how much more you can do if if you can't find someone else to play ball. Like, there's not a lot you can do, right? Like, I I don't think that the Kings should go out and trade Kevin Herter and two first round picks for Kyle Kuzma. I mm-hmm. I don't. And, you know, because that would basically, I mean, the Kevin Herter transaction would be up to like three first round picks at that point. Um, so that's not something that like, I'm I'm not putting it out there. Hey, you guys should do this or you're, you're going to get an, a B plus from me. Um, and, and I also, I don't typically do grades on off season. I, I just think like this one is pretty easy. Like, um, you know, you have to some pluses, some minuses. They didn't really have a bunch of losses. Uh, I, I think getting out from underneath some of the contracts they got out from underneath of were were good. Um, I think we'll, you know, again the B plus that would encapsulate them giving up two second round picks when they probably didn't have to uh, to move Sasha Vazenkov and and Davion Mitchell. Uh, but again, hindsight is twenty twenty. We don't know what that transaction looked like in June versus what it looked like in July. Uh, so. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I think it's a solid, solid offseason. You certainly improved your talent level greatly going from, you know, Duarte and Barnes to DeMar DeRozan. Hammer, what are the pitfalls? Because Pelton isn't the only one who's been a little snarky about this acquisition. What, in your mind, if any, are the pitfalls to the acquisition of DeMar DeRozan and the inclusion in, uh, of him into the Kings starting lineup? Yeah, I mean, first up, he, he'll he be 35 early in the season or before the season starts. So, I mean, mm-hmm. you are putting a lot of eggs in, in a basket that's, uh, you know, it's not getting any younger. Um, that That's one issue. Uh, I would also say, you know, like, he's not a natural three-point shooter, and you want to surround Demonis Sabonis with as many shooters as possible. Having two sort of non-shooters in your starting lineup is an issue, but... I also don't look at DeMar DeRozan as a non-shooter. He's just not a three-point shooter. He shoots plenty in the mid-range, a ton in the mid-range, and he's really good. Uh, so for all those times that we're sit- standing there like, look, Sabonis is going to have to fire from 18 feet. It's okay. You can get in a two-man game with DeRozan. He can be the one firing from 18 feet. Uh, so, like, look, I want to see how it how it looks on on the court before I completely you know trash the Kings for a player who – you know, again, I think is a really good fit piece. Um, but I also know that if that's a move you're going to make, you're going to have to, you're going to have to get a lot more three point shooting from other guys. You know, Fox is going to have to be better. Uh, and, you know, Keegan Murray has to be a lot better than he was last year. Um, you know, you need Monk to improve as a three point shooter. All of these guys are going to have to shoot better because you just lost a, a guy who, who made a ton of threes in, in Harrison Barnes. Mm-hmm. One of the things about DeMar that I, I've learned about, um, I'm kind of studying his game a little bit, though, that it might help the Kings out. That might you know, benefit them a little bit more. Is While he isn't this great three-point shooter, he is uh, above average or, or actually decent in the corners. And I, I'm just thinking about the games and the situations, and I could be wrong. I, I don't have the spray chart in front of me, but it felt like Harrison had a lot of corner three-point looks. So – Maybe, you know, it kind of ties in a little bit easier than than what people might give it credit for. Yeah, that's yeah. possible. I, I The biggest problem isn't so much whether DeRozan hits his three-point shots or not. It's that he doesn't take them, you know, so you are going down as far as, as, far as volume by, by I think it's like a 50%. Well, no, it's not. It's probably a, a 35% reduction from what Harrison Barnes. Harrison Barnes shot 4.7 threes per game last year. And he shot 38.7%. So those are really high quality numbers. Um, 
DeRozan is going to have to is going to have to at least get up to four threes a game. And I think this last season he was at two point eight, which is the second highest total of his career. And uh, again, you know, you can settle for the 33%. You, you're just needing him to shoot more. You'd hope that he'd get up to like 35%, but but like more like four and a half threes a game. Um, so you have the spacing on the floor that you need. Um, but then again, he brings so much uh, besides that to the game. You know, his ability to pull up from anywhere on the court, his ability to get to the rim, his ability to get to the free throw line, his ability to uh, set up his teammates. There are a lot of positives that you get from DeRozan uh, outside of the fact that he doesn't shoot bulk three-point shots. Wouldn't everything that you two just laid out and uh, throwing in some some numbers that Will Z has for us, Barnes did lead the team with 2.0 attempts per game from the corner. Uh, for reference, DeMar attempted 0.9 per game in the corner. Wouldn't all of this lead to the importance of Kevin Herter next year? Well, maybe, um, it just depends. Um, you know, again, uh, I, I can rephrase it. Wouldn't this all lead to the importance of good Kevin Herter next year? No, I, I can see where you're going there, but again, um, where, where are the minutes coming? Because mm -hmm. that that's going to be the issue. Um, you need forwards on this team. And I think Trey Lyles is going to play more minutes. I, I think, uh, Keegan Murray is set to play, you know, 35 plus minutes a game this coming season. Uh, DeMar DeRozan led the league in, in minutes played and minutes per game last season, over 37. Um, so, so look, I, I don't know where Kevin fits in, especially since a guy like Keon Ellis sort of fits a role better. He plays, he's a much better defender. He's not as big as Kevin Herter, but you know, he shoots a three ball as well as Kevin. Uh, it's just a different style of shooter. He's not a motion shooter as much as he is a catch and shoot shooter. Um, so I don't know. I, all I know is in order to keep the spacing alive, this team is going to have to make sure that they have, you know, three shooters on the floor at all times with DeRozan and, and Sabonis. Uh, and, and sometimes you're going to need a four shooter when one of those guys is off the court. So um, it, it definitely is, is a question mark, but I'd go back two years ago when we were walking into the season and it was the first full season of De'Aaron Fox and Demontis Sabonis. And everyone was so concerned about their inability to shoot the three point shot and having both those guys as your star players who can't shoot threes. And they went on to have the highest offensive rating in the history of the game. So, you know, I, I'm not as concerned about it because I think that there's a way to get around some of these issues. You, you, um, brought his name up and uh amy had a, a really good question uh yesterday that gave me pause i came with a uh, an answer but i had to think about it for a second and it's you talk about development and who would you want to see improve their game and we talk about keegan murray and keon ellis what what do you think is better for the kings if keegan murray stayed the same and keon elevated his game or if it was the other way around, if Keon stayed the same and Keegan elevated his game. Um, I, I'm going to do kind of a cop out here. Why can't both of them just improve? So they could, because that's mean, not the yeah. question, James. <laughs> yeah. God, I, I, you're just like VJ yesterday in the chat talking about, I want them both. <laughs> well, that's great, pal. We're doing a radio show here. Yeah. But I mean, there is a pathway for both of them to improve. Sure. So, um, I think like, look, uh, the next question, James at answers that we actually asked will be the first one. Yeah. I think if Keon, <laughs> Keon has a potential, James is not here for our radio nonsense <laughs> whatsoever. <laughs> Sorry, man, Keon has an opportunity to just continue to get, to solidify himself as a player that he is. And, you know, like his, like his production is always going to be dependent on you know, the opposition is going to be dependent on how many times his teammates find him. I don't think he's going to all of a sudden forget how to sh shoot the three ball and, and drop to like a 33% shooter. This is a very, very good shooter. Uh, I think he can shoot 38, 39, 40% for his career from the three. And, uh, but his role is always going to be very similar to what it is, uh, that what it was down the stretch. 
there's going to be certain nights where you need more from him, where he needs to shoot more and certain nights where he catches fire and you're going to ride the hot hand, but there's going to be other nights where someone else is cooking and he's going to get four or five shots and you're going to be okay with that. Keegan, on the other hand, is the guy that I think um, it, it's just kind of De, DeRozan comes in the door and he's up here, but I think everyone expects DeRozan at 35, 36, 37 to start, you know, at least falling a little bit in, as far as productivity. And as he's falling, you want Keegan to take his spot. Um, and I don't know that Keegan's going to be a 24 per, uh, point per game guy, but I'm also not going to say that he can't be. Um, you know, I think he can get to that point. But I, I think what DeRozan did is he bought you a year to let Keegan get really comfortable with being more uh, of who he is. And then the following year, you're going to want to see Keegan take that next step again. And that might mean less for DeRozan. And it's just kind of a balance, balancing act. Uh, but I also think that having a guy like DeRozan helps Keegan, his ability to pass, uh, to set a teammate, teammate up where, you know, Harrison Barnes had that ability, but he didn't use it very often. Uh, you know, Harrison Barnes never averaged five assists per game. So I guess your question is, I think it, it's probably better if I had to answer your specific question. It's better that Keegan Murray continues to ascend and and not Keon Ellis, because I think Keon, being the player that he is, can be that player for a long time in the league, just like Kentavious Caldwell Pope, you know, that type of guy, Torian Prince. Yeah, and and, and to, I, I agree, that's what I went with too. And to that point, like, if I say Keon doesn't improve, that doesn't mean he gets worse. That right. means he's what he was right. last year. And what he was last year <clears throat> is it's just fine. Like, it's, it's helpful. Well, I think, that's, basketball. I think that's part of the thing with this offseason, gentlemen, is I, I, we all saw Keon, and we know what he did. But, I mean, is everyone 100% certain that that's what's going to happen this year? I mean, we kind of just did this with Herter. Now it it it, 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 it Herder I don't I think inarguably had the worst season of his career last year with Keon it, I won't speak for anybody else I'll speak for for myself I'm still not exactly sure what I saw like it 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 feels like Mike was searching for something for an eternity and it wasn't there with Duarte it wasn't there with Kevin and then he found it in Keon and he just kind of was like all right I got something here. And then you, you know, you, you, you deal with the injuries to Malik and to Kevin Herter. And now Keon is in an entirely different role that even Mike Brown right. wasn't it, ready for. You know, you know what it was though, is it was a top seeing Keon Ellis be a top flight defender. And that's something that you can rely on more than somebody shooting 44% from three in the season. You. Okay. Right? Cause that could change. Keon, ain't, I, I'm very confident. Keon ain't never gonna change. He might. Where does defense go? Yeah. <laughs> right. I, that that ain't never. That's we saw a glimpse of who he is, and he can only yeah. improve on that. And I think that's that's why we come into next season feeling like at least at least we know, at least I know or I believe that's like the floor for Keon. What we saw last year. That's what yeah, I, and also like if you look at per thirty six, uh, which is like a good indicator. Just it's, it's a good way to look at players who who play seventeen minutes a night. Right. So um, he averaged 11.4 points, but 4.6 rebounds, 3.1 assists, 1.9 steals, and 1.1 blocks. This is Keon. Uh, 46% from the, the field and 41.7% from three. Um, if he averaged 11.4 points per game as a 30 something minute per game starter, but he played excellent defense and you had three other guys on the court that can. Um, that are going to be close to between 18 and, and 25 points per game. Uh, that's a pretty good piece to have in your starting five. Um, it's it's the dirty work guy that this team seems to lack all the time. And I don't want to compare him to Doug Christie because I think Doug was a much more accomplished player and a much more accomplished scorer when, uh, when he got to Sacramento. But that's sort of the type of role you need him to take. He doesn't need to be a guy that's going and looking for 15 a night, where if Kevin Herter is on the court, because Kevin is limited in some of the other things that he does, you kind of do need that. You need Kevin to be, you know, 14 points, 15 points, but also shooting 38, 39% from three. And, you know, again, Herter had a bad season last year. I, 
I would expect him to have a bounce back. Um, but your, your question is always going to be like, where does he fit in? And are you as a team, are you better with having a guy who scores less in your starting five in Keon Ellis, who plays exceptional defense and can take some of the pressure off both DeRozan and De'Aaron Fox, or are you better having a true like floor spacer that people fear? Mm-hmm. It'll take another year before people fear Keon Ellis, and he's going to have to shoot 38, 39% from three again to make people fear him and make people defend him honestly. But even still, that's going to be really tough uh, because all the focus is going to be on the other four guys if he's in your starting lineup. The, the, real quick, the other aspect of that question is like if if Keon got better and Keegan stayed the same, you're a better team. You're cool. If Keegan got better, and I'm talking about like he's at 15 points a game now, if he turned into an 18 point per game score mm-hmm. and like got to the line and all this other stuff, mm-hmm. now you're talking about the wildest thoughts you could have in the NBA, like mm-hmm. conference finals, maybe a championship contender. Like it with his improvement elevates your ceiling as a team i think yeah and i think what i really like about like we're having this conversation about this group of players we're kind of leaving malik monk out of the conversation and he's the other guy that just walks on the court and can get you you know 25 30 points at any point and that's where like look the kings are going to be like offensively they're going to be really potent and i could see realistically like a way that keon ellis could maybe bump up to seven or eight points per game, but the Kings could be way better with him in the rotation. And, uh, and, and again, when we talk about like minutes, like how do you get harder minutes? How do you get uh, Trey Lyles minutes? Um, like you are going to run out of minutes when it comes down to the, the Fox monk Ellis, you know, Murray DeRozan Sabonis six man group uh, there. You're going to have, somebody's going to lose out on minutes here and it's not going to be, even if we get to that point, that's six guys. Your next two guys are, are Herder and, and Trey Lyles. This team is just deeper and better than it was last year. Right. As of right now, um, they still need some more, but I still think it's deeper and, and like more accomplished than it was before. Uh, sorry to go inside the game here a little bit. I, I know it's a little early. I have two kind of like, lengthy questions so let's 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 step out now and we'll come back um we've got james ham here with us um we're talking kings basketball i have a couple of questions based on what you two were just talking about and one point about damar that i swear we're the only show that's ever brought up and i want to bring it to james that's coming up here uh as we close out the week strong delo casey james ham on sacramento sports leader espn 1320 good stuff Good stuff. I didn't want to throw that question at you, and then it, you know, I, th- I think we could cook a little bit. So, yeah, I could just ask them if uh, Jerry Jones reminds him of Pat Patrick Mahomes. Wow. That, that was amazing, <laughs> absolutely incredible. Oh my gosh, we we completely skipped over the Patrick Mahomes Kermit the Frog thing today. Oh man, that was on our our list, and I you see he responded. Got, I don't know. He responded. So, so the the Raiders did their thing. He did something today. But what K- Casey's talking about something entirely different. It's 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 funny. Yeah. So so Jerry Jones was talking in a press conference, and Jerry said, "We talk about the read option and and running the read option and 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 you know you could just tell him, bro. Do. You could just tell him. Well, you get a better a better effect. When you I don't. And you know it, it reminds me of. When I was quarterback and how I would, you know, be under center and we'd run the option. And at the last second, I'd make that decision on whether or not to hand it off to the running back or keep it. Or, and I slide to that very last second across the sideline, almost to the sidelines. And then at the last moment, that's when I would make that decision. And, you know, it'd, it'd be great timing. Reminds you of Patrick Mahomes, doesn't it? So, oh. yeah. If that's, you close your eyes, it's like said. Jerry Jones is here. It's not. It's actually not. <laughs> Have you tried? You wouldn't know if you haven't tried. <laughs> You're I, the I, instigator I, behind all of this. <laughs> Jerry said his game was like Patrick Mahomes. Oh, no. I, Did you see that picture? Did you guys see that picture of LeBron with, with the flag? 
No, I didn't. Oh, it's uh, just pull up my profile. It is fire. I'm like, can you unblock me so I can pull? Yes, it? I will do that right now. Um, I think it just manually blocks you like every hour <laughs> just to make sure. Like that's a photo LeBron. He it, like blows up and has hanging somewhere in one of his houses. Like that is a fire oh, wow. picture. I'm trying to find um, offensive rating. Uh, oh, I don't want. Jeez, why am I not finding advanced? I'm trying to look for the advanced statistics. Uh, just offensive rating, defensive rating on Keon Ellis. <laughs> Somebody called him. Captain America. <laughs> <laughs> they put that lead in there. Oh man, that. the one right below it is is, yeah, is kind of crazy, crazy too. too. I saw that one raining like I don't know what. Wow. Okay, I found it. Yeah, Keon Ellis' offensive rating was a one fourteen point four, and his defensive rating was a one oh nine for a plus five point five uh, net rating. And I, I was looking that up because someone in the chat said that he should only play 10 minutes a game. And like, I don't know what you're talking about. Luke Price, there you go. Luke Price, he's not Luke. a 10 minute per game player. Come on, Luke. We're back, Hammer. All right, final stretch of the day. Uh, shout out to King James. We found a pretty, uh, we found because we discovered it just <laughs> like Christopher Columbus did. Uh, that that picture that's floating around on Twitter is pretty amazing of LeBron with the flag and the athletes behind him on the boat, and there's a couple of attached picks with the rain pouring down. What a it, it looked like from what we saw of it, an absolutely phenomenal opening ceremonies, and why we couldn't hear a word for about a five minute span. The push notifications that I get from Vanity and the Hollywood Reporter, it was Celine Dion, Celine Dion, Celine Dion, Celine, Celine, Celine Dion. A lot of that on the, on the timeline for sure, man. Um, real quick. I just seen this little stat too. Uh, Dream Team. I don't know if you saw this. Dream Team faced nine NBA players in the Olympics. Yeah, the twenty twenty four team will face sixty one NBA players. Well, they may not face them, but there's sixty one NBA players in this uh, uh, Olympics. Spectacular. Yeah. World's getting better. Indeed, yeah. indeed. But the question is: Are the Sacramento Kings? And Hammer, this was the question I was going to ask you. Based on the conversation you guys were having and the question that Casey posed you about Keegan, Keon, if, if this one gets better, this one stays the same, and so on. I'll take De'Aaron just for because I feel I, I feel like this should be obvious, but I'll do it. Just De'Aaron, uh, Domas, and I'm gonna throw Demar in, though we don't know what that looks like. And I have I have I have another thing I want to talk to you about Demar about, but we'll take De'Aaron, Domas, and 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 Demar. Take those three out of the equation. Given the offseason that the Kings had and so on, can the Kings afford a bad season from anybody to get where they want to go? Oh, um, you you just mean De'Aaron, like that so group? De yeah. So De'Aaron, Domas, and 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 uh, Demar, take them out of the equation. They the Kings can't afford a bad season from those guys. Let's let's operate with that idea. They can't afford a, a, a bad season. But, but when we talk about Malik and Keon and Keegan, um. Jordan, whoever you want to throw in this conversation, can they survive a bad season from somebody? Yeah, I think they can. Um, like, first of all, if your big three are are going to be as productive as we expect them to be, um, I, I don't think that Malik Monk is a player who's going to have bad seasons, mm -hmm. right? So, I, I like, he has bad stretches and he has bad games, but overall, I think he's a player that, you know, is on the ascend. And, and I also think that the way that he plays, um, it gives you that, that backup point guard that, that this team really needs. So for me, um, like if you can increase the depth around your team in general, which I think the, the team is kind of done at this point, I, I think Devin Carter would have changed some of this like conversation as well, because I do think he would have played and I think he would have helped this, this specific issue. But if De'Aaron Fox goes down for like a certain amount of time, um, I, I think that they have like 
Deer and Fox 2.0 sitting right there to plug in and play in Malik Monk. And I also think that you might have the depth around, again, if you're going to use Kevin Herter, say, off the bench, uh, and you have Trey Lyles off the bench, you might be able to support uh, the starters where last year I don't think you could have taken Malik Monk and put him in the starting lineup and had him help out. So I always I look at this a way that um, I, I look at the NFL and and quarterbacks. Like I've never understood why it is like I get what the Saints do where they have a starting quarterback and then they have this like wild card that plays tight end half the time as their backup, right? But outside of that, I, I don't get teams that that go out and either draft pocket quarterbacks when they have a run first quarterback or they have a run first quarterback and then they their backups are all pocket or all uh, like pocket guys. Like I think the Kings are able to continue uh, have continuity between the first and second team, but also if you have a major injury to Fox, uh, you should be able to like have again continuity where like I don't think they had that in the past, uh, especially when you add DeRozan to that mix, who can take some of that stress and and you can again start using a uh, sort of DeRozan and Monk as your backups, uh, like major ball handlers, if Fox is out for any amount of time. So yeah, I think that they can have like guys have not a great season, but I I also don't expect like if Kevin Herter doesn't have a great season, like you're not going to play him all that much. If you know Trey Lyles has a bad season, uh, for me a bad season for Trey Lyles is is that he misses 30 games. Not that he he's different than who he is as a player, because Trey isn't like exceptionally consistent as a player. But what he does do is he makes good basketball plays. The problem is that you know he has injury problems, and I don't think you have a ton of depth at that position. Um, so yeah, I I don't know. I maybe you'd have problems if if all of these guys just decided that they weren't going to improve and took a step back. But I don't think that's going to happen. Yeah, I think that you can survive a bad season from you, you you didn't say the big three, so we'll leave them out. But like if Malik 15 points per game last year, if he's like, like Harrison, for example, goes down three points per game, you know, and just isn't necessarily the same. I think you got uh, th- that acquisition of DeMar. It, it, it changed a lot because last year you wouldn't be able, like if they didn't sign DeMar came back with the same team that I think, Still could have been a playoff team, but Monk has a down year. That's that's it. They needed everybody on that roster to operate at a high level. Now there's a little bit of uh, a little bit of a cushion here, where if somebody has a year, and we talk about like a bad year. We're talking about like like I said, Harrison Barnes or Kevin Herter last year, where they we classified as a down year, but it's still uh, I think ten points per game for Herter and. 12 for Harrison. They didn't fall off a cliff. Mm-hmm. If somebody has something like that, like Monk or Keegan Murray or something like that, I still think they got enough firepower to be able to handle at least one of those guys. If you got more than those guys having down years, then it gets a little sketchy, but I think you can handle one of them. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think what would change my mind is if DeMar DeRozan came out and wasn't a perfect fit and went from a guy averaging 24 last year to a guy averaging 16. And now it's like, oh, Okay, like number one, are we seeing the age progression happen like overnight, which would be catastrophic, which you don't think is going to happen. Uh, But number two would be like, okay, now these other pieces have to step up. Like I could there is a world in which Malik Monk averages less, uh, considerably less than what he did last year, his 15 points where he averages 13. But it's it's because you now have a guy at your small forward spot that doubles up what the previous guy averaged. You know, Harrison Barnes averaged 12 points a game. DeMar DeRozan averages 24. Those 12 points don't just magically appear and all of a sudden the Kings are averaging 129 a game or 132 a game. Like those, some of those points are coming from somebody else. So uh, James Ham, the master of transitions there, because the next thing I, I wanted to bring up was DeMar. And, and, I, and, and the way you set it up, Hammer, without knowing this was direction I was going, this beautiful is we're talking about there's a lot of talk about DeMar's age and uh, you know, defenders of the Kings and DeMar's acquisition will point to the amount of minutes he's played, the amount of games that he's played, uh, 
how well he takes care of himself, how much he's played over the course of his career, all of those different things. And the detractors will point out the age. But I feel like the common ground is pretty simple. This isn't Chicago. He's going to a team, you know, that won 46 games last year. That's not good enough. They won 48 games the year before. And that set this kind of beam team hysteria, trademark Kenny Caraway, into um, where we're at. And he's stepping into a place where maybe he doesn't have, I I know he's going to want to, but maybe he doesn't have to play the amount of minutes that he's played in Chicago over recent years. Like he doesn't, we want DeMar to be like the guy, like we want DeMar to be, we know De'Aaron is, is that's the, that's the man that's blue chipper right there. He's one. And Domas is, is probably two in like his own unique way. But I, I feel like what no one has brought up is the fact that, not that DeMar can come in and take it easy. That's not what I'm saying. But DeMar doesn't have to come in and lead the Sacramento Kings the way that he was leading the Chicago Bulls. Yeah, I mean, the pressure Hell, should be off Antonio him. Spurs. Sorry, James. Yeah. I feel like the same might have been true for the Spurs. Go ahead. Yeah, the pressure is definitely off him. The same thing about the Toronto Raptors. He doesn't have to be the same player anymore. Right. Uh, and, and the system itself doesn't require that. Like, I think that there were certainly times where De'Aaron Fox ran out of juice last year. We saw sort of a fade and then him have strong months and, and rough months. But I also think, that, like, the weight of the world was on him last year after the season before where he was so good and and led the team uh, to the playoffs. Um, but I'd also, like, point out the, the thing about DeMar is that um, he's made the playoffs quite a few times in his career, but he's also never had, like, the crazy deep playoff run, right? It's always first-round stuff. Um, you know, I think he's played something like 56 playoff games or something like that. And uh, 60, 63 playoff games. The reason I bring that up is that like, I think I told you guys this once before I, years ago, I was looking at like just sheer minutes played. Right. And I, it, I thought it was weird that Kevin Martin was running out of gas at the age that he was. Uh, and then he just like disappeared so quickly as an NBA player. And I went back and I looked at Kevin Martin as a player and compared his minutes to Kobe Bryant and Kobe Bryant at the age of 28 and Kevin Martin at the age of 28, counting it, factoring in uh, playoffs and college and not college and all that stuff. Um, Kobe had played 2,500 minutes more than Kevin Martin and just like kept going until, until really Kobe's body completely fell apart. DeMar has played a lot of minutes in the regular season, but he hasn't had one summer after another, after another, after another, where he's going so deep into the playoffs. And that's where we started to see, you know, the Clay Thompson injuries start to stack up. Uh, it's the one guy who avoids this for whatever reason is LeBron James. I, I don't know how LeBron has done what he's done, but almost every other player that, that does this continuous, like long playoff run every single year, Eventually they fall off the, you know, their numbers fall off a cliff for at least a year or two. And sometimes they can bounce back and have a good productivity year or two. But, you know, again, we start to see this fade. DeMar DeRozan shouldn't have that nearly as much as some of the players, some of his contemporaries, because he hasn't played the sheer volume of games and minutes in the playoffs that just keep going and going. Um, So I I don't know. I I think DeMar is going to be a guy that steps on the court and we see a lot of what we saw in the past from him. But also, like he doesn't have to play hero ball, and and you can save him, and you can save Fox for the fourth quarter, and you can use all of these mechanisms in place, like Malik Monk, to take some of the pressure off these guys. And so, with the last six or eight minutes of a fourth quarter, you now have like two of the most elite like finishers in the game, and, and maybe even three of the most elite finishers in the game. So this team has the potential to be really creative and different than any team that I think I've seen, and. The, the one key is that they've got to figure out how to play together and how to share the wealth and, and how to like support each other and make each other better. The, the one, one of, I should say the things that we kind of look past and I think can um, benefit this team a lot and benefit this player is DeMontis Sabonis. I can see his points per game, maybe taking a dip, not a, not a huge dip, but what was that? 19, was it 19.9 last I think year? it was 19.9. Yeah, yeah, I could see him being. A, That's why everyone hates him. Should have been 20. <laughs> and them guys at the ringer would have liked him. It would have been different. At 20 and 13 would have been. would have been all different. second team. Yeah. 
Um, I can see him going to 16, maybe 15 points a night, but I think that's better for him. You know, I, I think uh, somebody looking at him as being, no, you've got to be the guy, the second score, where you need your, you know, 20 points a night to go along with your rebounds and distribution and all this other stuff. I think it better serves him to be um, a third, fourth option, which I think he he might end up being in a lot of scenarios here. And then, you know, it, I think it also help him just be a, a, a great finisher. You know, he's going to be a guy that doesn't have to initiate the offense, doesn't have to create the offense. He's on the pick and roll. He's just finishing around the basket. And, and, and maybe that leads him to have more, even more of an effect on the offensive rebounds because that's, you know, he, he can he can focus a little bit more on that as opposed to, yo, we don't get your 20. I don't know, man. We need you to step it up. Like, and not saying you were wrong, but like D'Lo might not have to ask him shoot two more times, hmm. you know, because it's not as imperative because you got DeMar there, you got Keegan, you got Malik, you got Fox. Yeah, I think we always talk about this this weird thing, like, you know, who's your first, your second, your third best player, right? And I, I think that what this does is, like, I still think Sabonis is one of your top two best players. I think it's still Monk, and it, I mean, it's still Fox, and it's still Sabonis. And then DeMar DeRozan. And then we can, like, argue about who's the fourth best and the fifth best. And we don't have to, or we can. I don't care. Um, but my point is that even though I think Sabonis is one of your best two players, he's not one of your top two scoring options. And so I actually think that when teams are game planning for the Kings, adding DeMar DeRozan and his ability to create and his ability to, uh, you know, again, create off the dribble, create for others, all that stuff, it will open things up for Demonis Sabonis in a different way because the first scout on this team is going to be how do we stop De'Aaron Fox? The second one is how do we help out and and support somebody guarding DeMar DeRozan? And then the third one is how do we how do we slow down uh, the you know the DHO and everything that is Demonis Sabonis? And and so I just think it's going to add like a new element to their offense and and potentially like there's a possibility of Sabonis's points per day, per game go up. Like he doesn't have to try to score more, but I also don't feel like most times he does try to score too much. I, you know, he scores within the flow of the offense most times. And the times that he doesn't score within the flow of the offense, it's because he's taking too few shots, not too many. And we're all complaining about him taking six shots or eight shots in a game. So I think that he's going to have a lot more opportunity. And, and again, in a starting five, where I think we we know for sure the four of the starters who four of the starters are, it it's of course it's Fox, it's Keegan, it's Sabonis, and it's and it's DeRozan. You now have like two elite passers to play make for somebody else at all times. Three passers on the court, three guys that are on the court starting that average over eighteen assists per game as a as like a, a three dudes. And so that's just going to create new opportunities for everybody. So I, I, I don't know. I, I don't think that they're going to have a lot of problems. Do you think um, Mike knows who's starting right now at two? Um, no, because I, I don't know that the Kings are done. Um, I, I still think there is potential for them to make moves. Um, I think that there are discussions about who some people think should start and who other people are going to think should start. And that's going to always going to be a little sticky, right? Um, because there are other opinions in the building other than just Mike's on who should be starting and who shouldn't. Um, you know, we've heard like the potential for Trey Lyles to start. And if Trey Lyles starts, uh, that means DeMar DeRozan is your starting shooting guard. So, you know, again, I think it's slightly situational. Um, I think there is a possibility that Malik Monk starts, but if I'm starting Malik Monk with the the other four guys that we just keep talking about, then that to me wouldn't be the smartest. Like you in the NBA, you never start your best five offensive weapons. Um, that that doesn't usually work out. So uh, yeah, I think like there's definitely a point where Mike has an idea of who he would like to start. Um, but I think you also want to get everybody into training camp. And you want to get them that the two weeks before training camp playing on five on five and, and you'll instantly see chemistry between some players and, and a lack of chemistry between others. 
And you're just going to keep looking and looking and seeing the the two man lineups, the three man, the four man, and then the five man lineups that you think work best together. Um, and, and that that goes for the bench and for the the, the starters. And, and eventually, he'll come away with something that is more tested than it is today, as opposed to today being like theoretical. Like theoretically, who should start on paper? You can have your opinion. I can have my opinion. I don't think any of us are way far off of each other. Um, but until you see it in practicality, then I'm not going to, you know, I think Mike is going to reserve judgment. Real quick, Casey, can you run that line back one more time about Mike Brown it might not be the only one who has a say in the starting five? Was that was that the line you said or did I miss and did I mishear that? Well, yeah, I mean, Mike Brown is the one who's ultimately going to say who's the starting five. But um, but that doesn't mean there's not other people in the building that have input and who they think should start and who you think should start and all that stuff. But Vec Ronadive meddling in basketball. No, I, I didn't say that. You Walmart said that. In 1320. <laughs> you said that. I did not say that. No, there are other – like, look, uh, there are people who draft players or – people who sign free agents. There are people who make trades for players. Like there's opinions in the building and there should be opinions in the building. At the end of the day, Mike, it's Mike Brown's decision to put the guys, the five guys on the court to start and the eight or nine guys in the rotation that he feels gives himself and his team the best opportunity to win. And he'll make those decisions. That doesn't mean that as of right now, there aren't some opinions floating around about who should start, and who shouldn't. Uh, that could be coming from someone other than Mike Brown. Do you think this is something that I I kind of thought I'm not on the record saying this I believe this happened or whatever, but do you think that Malik Monk kind of got a at the very least a wink wink like yo we, we we're really considering starting you because I keep on going back to um, what. What was there to entice him to come back? It could be nothing. It could be he just understood everything perfectly, thought this was a great situation, and wanted to come back. It could be as simple as that. But if it feels like, all right, man, like last two years was cool. Like, what, what's going to be different? The money's not going to be different. Will the role be different? You know, do you, do you think that at the very least those conversations were had during the uh, negotiation period? And especially for him to – to just sign so quickly that like he didn't even take it into free agency. Yeah, I think situations matter. And and I think that the situation in Sacramento is something that Malik knew very well, like this is a good situation for him. And there could also be other good situations out there for him, but this one is a really good situation. And he's been through other situations that weren't good at all for him, right? So you know who the coach is, you know, that you're one of your best friends is going to be there. You know, that the city loves you. You know, that you've got a really, really cool, uh, like situation worked out on the court that could improve, but could also, even if it doesn't improve, it's still a really, really good position for you. That's going to allow you to make 80 million bucks over the next four years. And, uh, I think that like, could there have been promises? Maybe. But let's just, let's be like super honest here. Like they, they went out and they signed DeMar Rosen, and then they had intentions at least to get, to stay in the conversation with bull marketing and possibly Kuzma. And if that, if either one of those trades would have happened, then Malik Monk isn't starting at mm -hmm. all. I mean, in that situation, you're talking about the Aaron Fox, DeMar Rosen. Uh, Keegan Murray, Demonis Sabonis, and either Lori Marketin or Kyle Kuzma in your starting five. So if you're a general manager, if you're a coach, you're an owner, you don't lie to your players. You're honest, you're upfront with them. You tell them that like there's potential, but at the same time, there's also potential for you to be in the same position you were last year, just with twice as much money and security for four years. And, and so we're not going to make promises to you because like, this is the NBA life happens fast. And that's why I also think like Malik Monk could have taken more money to go to Orlando. The head coach for Orlando could flame out in six months. And next thing you know, they're parting that team out or whatever. 
and he goes from being a starting point guard to a backup to sometimes even a guy who's out of the rotation. And we all think that that there's no way that that can happen. It's happened to players like Malik Monk and better players than Malik Monk multiple times in the history of the NBA, where you go somewhere thinking that it's going to be one thing and it, and it just doesn't prove to be that here. He knew exactly what he was going to be with the potential for more. And, and I think he was comfortable with that and, and enjoyed the idea of that because again, that Charlotte situation for him early in his career was just like, he thought he was out of the league. Mm-hmm. And, and you can like that, that's jarring to think you're, you know, a lottery pick. And a couple of years later, you might not have another paycheck coming from the league and might have to go to Europe, might have to go play somewhere else. It's tough. And so I think security was, was good for him here. I think it's also interesting to wonder like what they shared with him at the time, because it wasn't, you know, his free agency kicked off as James just mentioned. They were involved in heavy lorry marketing conversations. And we we know that their interest in DeMar DeRozan was real from the jump. And obviously you can't tell Malik, hey, we're gonna go get DeMar DeRozan or hey, we're gonna go get Lori marketing, but you probably do share with and I think we also have this idea that Malik is sitting across from Monty McNair and this conversation is happening. When in reality it's probably Monty, West Wilcox, maybe a handful of others, and it's I think in this situation, James, no, but it's it's Jeff Schwartz and probably his closest, you know, confidants on the phone or on a Zoom call or whatever going through these different things. And Jeff is hip to what's going on around the league. He probably represents some of these guys. And I'm sure those conversations is about what the Kings were looking to do on July 1st, or I guess it was June 30th, how heavily in, much more impactful they could be if Malik was already signed. Because that's kind of the forgotten thing. DeMar, Laurie, none of that stuff can happen until Malik Monk signs. And the fact that Malik signed before any of that stuff could start is is a good look. Yeah, I think he had conversations with, I think Malik individually had conversations with Mike, with De'Aaron, with Domas, with Keegan, with Harrison Barnes before he was gone with um whoever the on the coaching staff he's close with with Monty with Wes with Vivek like they had a lot of conversations about how to make him feel comfortable without making like tremendous promises and being honest and upfront with him yeah and then Malik took that went to his agent and said I'm ready to get something done so get mm-hmm. something done with them ahead of time that's typically how it would work Malik was controlling a lot of this. And, and again, it's not just Malik's agent. Malik, age, his agent and his brother um, are you know, in tandem here. I, I think that realistically, they looked at Sacramento and thought this is a really, really good spot for him to land for the next four years where we know he's going to make a lot of money and we know he's going to have success and we know he's going to have a good time and not lose his love of the game and and be embraced. And uh, And sometimes that's, those are things that matter for players. Every player is different. You never know. Some players want they want the bright lights in the big city. They want to be, you know, swoon. They want to have expensive dinners and free agency. That ended up not being what Malik wanted. I know what my big brother would tell me in that situation. We ain't going to Detroit, dog. <laughs> we ain't going to Detroit. There ain't no way. It's so cold. There ain't in the no way. <laughs> they just fired uh, their coach. <laughs> they, they, they had all of the they we joke about these grades. Pelton gave him a D. Oh. How are you that bad? Oh, Detroit. Goodness gracious. Detroit. Uh great stuff. Uh this week, <laughs> James. D in Detroit. Oh, they have, they have Greeny Caraway right there. <laughs> Greeny Caraway. Uh, we appreciate you so much for being with us. You know the drill. We're gonna flip over to 1025 now. Uh, if you want more, we'll run it back. Nope, we'll just air something.